time he spends that time praying that whatever he has prepared would be, you know, worthy of the Lord's hearing. And I shared that my prayer, when it's my turn to preach, at that same moment is, Lord, please open up the floor and swallow me in, and then I can get out of this moment. Well, as you can see, my prayer was not answered this morning, and so I am here to bring a a word prepared for All Saints Day. Uh, But I really was kind of touched by what Jonathan was saying because... I think sometimes we have the idea that this preaching moment is very easy for the preachers and indeed we have been gifted with spiritual gifts that enable us and equip us to do this but it is sometimes a terrifying prospect to know that what you will be thinking about all day long is what you hear in the next 22 or maybe 84 minutes I don't know of course it's, it's me not Jonathan so it's probably more likely to be 22 than 84 but uh, it, is, it is a high and holy privilege to uh, be uh, permitted to stand and speak before you today. So let's take a look at our scripture this morning. We are in the first letter of John in chapter 3. And this is uh, short and it doesn't have any fancy long words in Hebrew. So let's read this all together because I think we are able. Read with me if you will. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So indeed, this is All Saints Sunday, and it is a day of celebration and remembrance, a time when we recognize the saints in our congregation who have gone before us, as we have just recognized those nine names with the reading of names and the tolling of bell and the lighting of a candle. And as Jonathan said in his prayer, and this is something that you will hear often in uh, funeral sermons and funeral liturgy, we understand that they have finished their course in in faith and they now rest from their labor and so I think that what we celebrate is that they have finished their prep work and the reason I say it in that that using that phrase is because I think that all of our earthly life here is prep work that's what we are doing we are preparing for our eternal life sometimes we lose sight of that and so it's good on All Saints Day when we celebrate those who have finished the preparation and now living in the fullness and the completeness of glory. They are with heaven, they're with God in a home that he has made with his own hands to recognize that we're still here, we're still doing prep work, but what can we learn from the saints who have gone before us and what can we learn this day? Now, some, this may be kind of a new concept to those of you who are new to Methodism, the idea that we celebrate All Saints Day. That if you're new to Methodism, you might be thinking, oh, I thought that was more of a Catholic thing. I didn't understand that Methodists have a concept of saints. And you're correct. We do not have an idea of saints in the same way that our Catholic brothers and sisters do. We don't believe in the canonization of human beings to become a, a separate group of people because John Wesley did not see any of that authorized through scripture. But Wesley was an Anglican priest, and so he was working in that concept and in that framework, and he writes in his journal in 1767 that he loved this day. He loved All Saints Day because it was a day of reminder of the tradition of those who go before us as pioneers of our faith. And so as Methodists, we do indeed celebrate All Saints Day as a day that we, when we can give thanks and appreciation for those who have gone before us. And we look at Hebrews 11 because, you know, why did, John, why did Wesley think the canonization of saints was not the way Methodism was going to go? However, the idea of all of us being saints is a biblical and appropriate way to be. And so we look at at Hebrews 11, and he gives us a litany of forerunners of the faith, Paul does as he's writing this. He talks about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Gideon, Samuel, Samson. You know, these are all ordinary people. They weren't canonized, and yet Paul writes this about them. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race, or in my words, the prep work, that is set before us. So what we're saying here is that all of you are saints. Now, does it shock you this morning to find out that you're a saint? Raise your hand if you're a little surprised to be told that you're a saint. 
Or does it shock you more to find out that the person sitting next to you is a saint? Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, not only do I have hands flying up in the air, I got people pointing over here. <laughs> it's kind of like being at the Oprah show on the day that she gives out cars. You're a saint, and you're a saint, and you're a saint. Everybody gets to be a saint. It is that concept in Methodism that we are all, uh, we are all a saint in, in our prep work and in our preparation. But I really like kind of the modern Catholic interpretation of this. This is what Pope Francis has said to his church, and I think this is a wonderful thing for us to think of too. To be saints is not a privilege for the few, but a vocation for everyone. So we struggle with this notion because I think we confuse the idea of being a saint, in other words, a, a person of faith, with being saintly. And that's where we, that's the hitch in our giddy up. That's where we kind of resist this notion. You know, Wesley talked about that we're all on, our, all on our way to perfection. In fact, when we take our ordination vows, we have to say, they ask us this question, you know, do you believe that you are on your way to perfection and that you will accomplish it in this world? And we don't like to say that because we think of perfection being perfectionism. We think of saints being saintly. But that's not what the question is aimed for. The question, even when we look at Matthew 5.48, where Jesus says, be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect, he's not implying a flawless life or a sin-free life or a mistake-free life, but being perfect in love, even as God's very nature is love. And so that's what Wesley was getting at. And our United Methodist website, uh, the Board of Discipleship, kind of explains this idea of what Wesley was talking about. You know, do you believe you're being made perfect in this life and will you achieve it in your lifetime? It says this, we are to press on with God's help in the path of sanctification, which just means our daily effort to try to be more holy than we were yesterday in the path of sanctification towards perfection. And by perfection, Wesley did not mean that we would not make mistakes or have weaknesses. Can I get a hallelujah? Rather, yes. Rather, he understood it to be a continual process of being made perfect in our love of God and each other and removing our desire to sin. Well, I'm pretty comfortable being part of that continual process. I want to be part of that continual process. But see, the perfectionists in, in, in all of us struggle with, we just struggle with this whole notion of being saints and being saintly. Let me ask you this, how many of you are willing to confess this morning, because you're perfect people and you don't want to say the wrong thing, how many of you know that you're a perfectionist? Raise your hand if you know you're a perfectionist. A lot of us know that we are, that's our a spiritual gift of being a perfectionist. How many of you live with a perfectionist? Mm-hmm. I raised a perfectionist, and I have to say that perfectionists are very hard on themselves. Amen. If you're a perfectionist or you live with one, you know that perfectionists are very, very hard on themselves. And that makes it hard to live with them when they're constantly beating themselves up. Uh, I found this good definition. Perfectionists are people who strain compulsively toward impossible goals and measure their self-worth in terms of their achievements. And maybe in some way we can find out and confess that we all have a little bit of perfectionism in us. Some of us to greater degrees, some of us to lesser degrees, but I think a lot of us can say that, that we have a little bit of that perfectionist tendency in us. I like this picture I found of uh, uh, somebody who stacked a log truck. Uh, this is what happens when you ask a perfectionist to do a job. I mean, I actually look at that picture and I think, that's really good. <laughs> I'd like to be able to do that. I, like, I wish I could do that. One of the greatest struggles that I think we have in our lives, perfectionists or not, or those with just small perfectionist tendency, is that there is this new thing called Pinterest. And it is evil. It's evil, it's evil, it's evil. It's evil, because you know why? It urges you toward a perfection that you can never possibly achieve. Can I get an amen from the Pinterest people? I found this picture that completely describes me and Pinterest. Saw hedgehog cake on Pinterest, nailed it. You know, I actually, I don't know if you can see, but I look close at it, and I think they use dentures for the teeth. Which, you know, is kind of handy and clever and creative and thinking outside the box. But I hate Pinterest because I am a Pinterest fail waiting to be happened. And the perfection that's put out on that website is something I can never achieve. So it just frustrates me. Why do I even try? Why do I even start? When our 
Pinterest dreams fail when our perfectionist tendencies don't match up with reality, when we are trying to create the perfect decoration, the perfect cake, the perfect party, and oh, it's coming, the perfect Christmas. Then what happens when reality meets that false expectation? Well, you know what happens is we engage in something called self-talk. Now, self-talk is something that psychologists have been studying for a long time. And let me, let me back it up this way by saying this. We all speak about 140 words per minute. So when you're talking to somebody, your average flow of talking is about 140 words per minute, unless you're from New Jersey, and then we top out at about 598 words per minute. Did you catch that? So that's the kind of normal conversation we have with each other, 140 words per minute. Psychologists have been studying this idea of self-talk, and self-talk is that constant voice in your head that is analyzing and commenting and critiquing on everything about, around you, and they have decided that your self-talk goes at about 900 words per minute. So self-talk is rapid and incessant, and always there, talk, 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 always in your head. In fact, right now as I'm preaching, you're all engaging in self-talk. You're adding editorial comments to what I'm saying. You're uh, analyzing things. You're looking at the hedgehog picture thinking, I could make that cake. <laughs> you have one idea that, that leads to another idea that then leads to another idea, and pretty soon you know exactly what you're going to order at the Black Pelican after lunch as soon as, soon as I shut up, because that's what self-talk does. Self-talk is something that everybody engages in. And unfortunately, psychologists have discovered that 70% of all self-talk is negative. So 70% or 600 words a minute of what we hear, what we're saying to ourselves is, I can't make that cake. I'm not smart enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not able. I'm not worthy. I'm too stupid. I can't do this. I'm inadequate. That's the kind of self-talk that we inundate ourselves with at a rate of 70% of all of the self-talk that goes on in our head. I went to an oyster roast last night, and I, it was a complete God moment because I happened to engage in conversation with Deb Keenan, and she gave me the word for this. We, I, I didn't tell her what I was preaching on. We were talking about something completely different. And she said, why do we always fall into that trap of awfulizing ourselves? And that's exactly what we do. We awfulize everything. We awfulize politics. We awfulize the government. We awfulize our houses that don't look like the Martha Stewart house. We awfulize our efforts because your cake looks like the bottom and not the top. We awfulize things. Self-talk is spent in awfulizing our feelings about ourself. Do you know that when you spend that much time beating yourself up, you are beating down a child of God. Because you are a child of God. And when you beat yourself up and when you awfulize yourself, you are awfulizing something that God made. And as they say, he don't make no junk. He made you in his image. So let's look back to the scripture. Because I think that that's where we find the answer to our negative self-talk, to our beating ourselves down. And this is what the scripture reminds us. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. Say it with me. I am a child of God. Yes, you're flawed. Yes, we're sinful. Yes, we're mistake-ridden. But we know who the Father is. We know who he is and we know whose we are. We are children of God. And so when that awfulizing overtakes you, when that self-talk is bringing you down, you need to stand up against it and say, I am a child of God. Say it with me. I am a child of God. When self-doubt and self-recrimination and self-abuse and self-abasement and self-blame and self-hate and self-accusations and self-destruction come against you, what are you going to stand up and say against it? I am a child of God. All right, I want to add a twist to this before we finish this. Who, who doesn't like a, a, a story where you have a twist at the end, something you didn't expect? Or maybe you're just glad to know the sermon's almost ready to end. So it's all good, regardless of how you interpret that. We've talked about prep work being in terms of our earthly existence being a preparation for the only thing that matters, our eternal life. 
And we are all here. Our saints have gone before us and they have finished their prep work. But we're here and we're still engaged in prep work. And it's so easy for us to lose sight of the eternal because we get so focused on that prep work in front of us that we lose sight of what is truly important, what is truly valuable, and what is truly meaningful because the prep work overtakes us. I think the word prep work takes on another meaning in the first week of November because, yes, indeed, we celebrated Halloween on Tuesday, and now what is it? Christmas! Merry Christmas, everyone. We're just going to skip right past you know, Thanksgiving, and already I know because it's the first week of November, you're thinking about Christmas. And we're going to spend so many hours in preparation and decorating and baking and shopping and wrapping and shipping and doing all that prep work that most of us will miss the point. Most of us will get so caught up in the prep work that Christmas will come and we'll be, thank God it's over. That will be our feeling. I have felt that in Christmases, where when it finally came, I was so relieved Shame on me. I got so caught up in the prep work of taking care of a family and making the perfect Christmas that I didn't enjoy the fact that this is all about the birth of a baby. It is all about God coming down in human form, making himself a tiny infant so that the world might be saved. That's the only point to Christmas. That's the only thing that matters. And our greatest frustration over these next eight weeks is not going to be over social injustice issues or the latest act of terrorism or the plight of the poor, of the government's failure to come up with any kind of plan or our kids leaving clothes on the floor. We're not going to be frustrated with any of that. We're going to be frustrated because there's not enough time to get everything done. It's November 5th, and I'm already behind. Can I get an amen? We've got to remember that there is no such thing as a perfect Christmas. I mean, prep work should be just that, that focusing on that baby. Now, you think about when a baby comes into the house, do you, are you even able to keep the house clean and prepare a gourmet meal of 12 courses? No, because you, you don't think about that kind of perfectionism. All you think about is love. When a baby comes into the house, it takes over, and the only thing that matters is love. I've been spending a lot of time since July 15th with my infant twin grandchildren and my two-year-old grandson. And I'll tell you, there, there's no perfection in that house. Hallelujah. Because the minute you walk in, you're handed a baby that wants to be fed or cuddled or, or diapered, and a baby that smiles at you when you give it that love. And that's what Christmas is. Christmas is all about the baby. So we need to forget about trying to make everything perfect to get ready for the baby, because when babies come, nothing is perfect. And that's the best part of it. It's all about love. Think about the first Christmas. I think God has a different standard of perfection than we do. I mean, Bethlehem was a little town. It was a no-account little town. It was a dirty place. It was a humble place. It was a place where David had come from, and David was a very imperfect man. But at one point in his life, David's faith was strong enough that it was said of him that he was a man after God's own heart. And in that same place, David's lineage, David's descendant, Jesus, the one true king, the only perfect person was born. In the midst of all that chaos and all that imperfection, the perfect baby came so that we might be saved. The first Christmas was far from perfect, and neither should our Christmases be. So children of God, I say to you this, be kind to yourselves. See if you can skip half of what you think you're going to be doing and focus on that baby and focus on that love. Just don't even get onto Pinterest this whole season. I mean, we just cast it out in the name of Jesus. We rebuke you and we say, get behind me. Get behind me, Pinterest. And embrace your flawed sainthood. Let's make this prep work about receiving this baby this Christmas. And let's agree to stop awfulizing ourselves. Because you are a child of God. You are precious and you are worthy and you are his. Say it with me one last time. I am a child of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of this season, the reminder that we are yours, the reminder that you are ours, and we know who you are. And as children of God, we stand in our imperfection, and we say to you, bring that baby home, and let us receive him with love, let us receive him with open hearts. 
Let us make room in our homes for this baby once again and let him reign in our prep work. And altogether, all of God's children said, Amen.